Welcome back to the channel. If you've been following the saga of interstellar object 3i Atlas, you know that for months, the scientific community has been holding its breath. We thought we had a handle on this visitor. We thought we understood its trajectory, its composition, and its behavior as it swung through our solar system. But new data has just come in from the Hubble Space Telescope. And to put it bluntly, some of our assumptions may need to be updated. On December 12th, and again, on December 27th, 2025, Hubble turned its Wide Field Camera 3, specifically the UVIS channel, toward 3i Atlas using the F350LP filter. These were not casual snapshots. These were deep exposures designed to pull faint structure out of a very difficult target as it continues its long journey outward. Astronomers expected something simple, a fading coma, maybe a little residual outgassing, and a tail that slowly weakens as the object moves farther from the sun. Instead, the images show a morphology that is much harder to summarize in one sentence. What stands out is a dramatic double feature structure, a dominant sunward facing feature that reads like an anti-tail, and a second weaker feature extending in the opposite direction. It is bilateral. It persists across two separate observing dates, and it does not fit neatly into the most casual comet mental model most people have in their head. Now before we go any further, I want to set a clear tone for this video. This is not a story about guesses. This is a story about what Hubble actually recorded, why it surprised people who model these objects for a living, and what the most realistic explanations are. The universe creates strange shapes all the time, and if you jump to conclusions too early, you usually end up missing the real physics, which is often more interesting than the first idea your brain grabs. To understand why the December images got attention, we have to rewind to July 2025, the last major benchmark observation many people were referencing as a baseline. In July, Hubble saw a different look, a single elongated jet-like feature, narrow and extended, with a geometry that felt easier to explain. The simplest interpretation was a localized active region on the surface being heated by sunlight, venting gas that drags dust outward in a relatively collimated stream. Not perfectly steady, but familiar enough that you could sketch a model and feel like you were not completely lost. But five months later, the picture is not just brighter or dimmer. It is different in shape. And in observational astronomy, a shape change is a big deal because brightness can be fooled by distance, viewing angle, and exposure depth. Morphology is harder to hand wave away. When a comet structure changes, it usually means one of three things is happening. The lighting geometry changed, the rotation state changed, or the surface activity changed, and sometimes all three at once. Let's talk about the first piece everyone notices, the sunward feature, the anti-tail-like structure. In comet science, an anti-tail is one of those terms that sounds more dramatic than it really is. It does not mean the comet is breaking physics or thrusting toward the sun. It is usually a geometry effect. When you see an anti-tail, you are often seeing larger, heavier dust grains that were released earlier and are now lying along the object's orbital plane. Because those grains are relatively large, sunlight does not push them around as efficiently as it pushes tiny dust. They do not immediately get swept into the classic long sweeping tail you see in photos. Under the right geometry, that sheet of dust can appear as a spike pointing sunward from our point of view. So the existence of an anti-tail-like feature by itself does not require a new kind of object. It can be a normal outcome of dust dynamics plus viewing angle. But here's the part that makes people pause. The second weaker feature pointing the other way and the fact that both features persist across multiple observing dates. If you are looking at two distinct structures, you have to decide whether you are seeing two separate jets from the nucleus or a single dust and gas system that is being separated into different visible components by solar radiation pressure and geometry. That difference matters because it changes what you infer about the surface and the internal structure of 3i Atlas. So let's walk through the most grounded explanation. First, the one that requires the least invention. Changing illumination and viewing geometry as the object moves along its post-perihelion arc. Think of 3i Atlas, not as a picture, but as a spinning body in three-dimensional space. When it was inbound, one hemisphere was preferentially sunlit. After perihelion, the geometry flips. The sun is now illuminating different facets at different angles. If the object has more than one volatile rich region, or if its surface has layered composition, the active areas that dominate the coma can change 
as the solar angle changes. In July, the jet could have been dominated by one region. In December, the solar illumination and the object's orientation could expose a different region, producing a new dominant feature. Meanwhile, the older region might not shut off instantly. It can continue to vent at a lower level due to thermal inertia, meaning the heat absorbed earlier continues to conduct inward and drive sublimation, even after that patch rotates into partial shade. This is not just theory. We have seen thermal lag on solar system comets. You heat a surface, the heat propagates inward, and activity can persist after the lighting condition changes. That could create the appearance of a weaker feature on the side that is not currently the most strongly illuminated. Now add one more real-world complication, rotation and wobble. Even a modest wobble can change how a jet projects on the sky. If a jet is near a pole and the rotation axis is tilted, you can see a jet trace a small cone over time. In high-resolution imaging, that can turn a single jet into a structure that looks split, doubled, or broadened depending on exposure stacking and the exact timing of the observation. The December frames are still snapshots, but they are deep enough that they are not just capturing a momentary flash. They are capturing a stable pattern of emission over meaningful time. So explanation one is a combination of new face in sunlight, old face fading, and to a jet geometry that becomes more complex as the viewing angle changes. That explanation is conservative. It is also probably where most professional discussions start. But the December data still forces a second question. What, physically, is being ejected? Because at the wavelengths used, what Hubble is primarily giving you is sunlight reflected off dust, and possibly some contribution from gas species, depending on the details. The fact that the structures are visible in reflected light implies dust is a major player in what you're seeing. And dust is where the story can get surprisingly technical. Dust grains do not all behave the same. The smaller the grain, the more strongly solar radiation pressure can push it relative to its mass. The larger the grain, the more it behaves like a tiny rock that mostly follows gravity and orbital momentum. That means a single outgassing event can create multiple visible components, a classic tail dominated by small particles that get pushed away, and an anti-tail-like sheet dominated by larger particles that stay closer to the orbit plane. So here's a second grounded explanation that can produce a two-feature look without requiring two separate active regions. You can get apparent bilateral structure from particle sorting. Imagine the nucleus releases a mix of dust sizes and gas. The gas escapes fast and disperses. The tiny dust gets pushed strongly by sunlight and forms a broad tail. But the heavier dust settles into a thinner plane aligned with the orbit and can appear as a sharper anti-tail. Under certain viewing angles, you can see both at once, and it can look like two opposing jets, even though the source is basically one emission, environment. In that framework, the weaker opposite jet is not necessarily a jet from the far side of the nucleus. It can be a component of the dust gas system that is being shaped differently by radiation pressure and the geometry of the observer relative to the orbit plane. If that's the case, the December images are not telling us the object has two engines or two nozzles. They're telling us the dust population changed, either in size distribution, release rate, or the timing of release. And now the dust sheet and the tail component are both visible. So the debate becomes, are we seeing two distinct nucleus jets or one dust system with two visible components? How do you decide? You decide by watching how the structures evolve in time and by measuring their brightness profiles and orientation relative to the orbital plane. If one component stubbornly follows the orbital plane and behaves like a sheet that supports an anti-tail dust explanation, if both components behave like collimated outflows anchored tightly to the nucleus and they rotate with the nucleus, that supports true dual jets. And this is where the two dates matter so much. December 12th and December 27th are separated enough in time that if the features are purely a perspective trick, you would expect a noticeable change in relative orientation as the Earth object sun geometry shifts. If the features persist with consistent alignment patterns, then they are more likely tied to a stable physical structure. But there is another reason the December observation is interesting. The directionality of the dominant sunward feature combined with continuing activity post-perihelion. Most people think comet activity should simply fade as the object moves away from the sun, and broadly, that is true. But there are exceptions and subtleties. An object can remain active for a long time if it has volatiles, 
with low sublimation and temperatures. If it has exposed fresh material due to surface changes near perihelion, or if it underwent fragmentation or cracking that opened new vents. In other words, perihelion is not just maximum heating, it can be maximum damage, and damage can turn into new active behavior weeks later. So one very reasonable idea is that the July jet was a stable vent, and the perihelion passage altered the surface by thermal stress, cracking, or localized collapse, exposing new, volatile pockets. Post perihelion, those new pockets become active even while the overall solar heating is decreasing. That can absolutely create a new dominant feature later in the timeline. It is not backwards. It is delayed cause and effect. If that is what happened, then the December images are showing the after effects of the October perihelion passage, the object's memory of that event, expressed in its evolving vents. Now let's talk about what this implies for the nucleus itself. The more complex the jet geometry, the more likely the nucleus is not a simple uniform ball of ice. It suggests a body with distinct active regions, possibly uneven composition, and potentially a rotation state that is not perfectly stable. And that last part matters because rotation is not just a detail. Rotation controls which areas are illuminated, how long they are illuminated, and how heat propagates into the subsurface. If the object's rotation axis is tilted, different seasons occur across its surface. If it tumbles, then the heating pattern becomes chaotic. If it is elongated, you can get strong torque effects from outgassing that can modify the rotation rate over time. A jet acts like a thruster in the most basic physics sense. It pushes back on the nucleus. If the jet is off-center relative to the center of mass, it also applies torque. That can change the spin rate and the wobble. That, in turn, changes which areas heat up next. You can get feedback loops. That feedback loop can take a relatively simple comet and turn it into something that looks unpredictable. So when people say, this defies simple models, what they often mean is, this is what happens when the simplest model is too simple. It is not always a sign that the object is fundamentally different from comets. Sometimes it is a sign that you are finally seeing the complexity that most comets probably have, but which is hard to observe at this level of detail. Now, there is one more key point in your intro that deserves to be highlighted. The contrast between July and December. In July, the jet looked like a narrow, elongated beam. In December, the dominant feature looks more like a broad dust structure that forms an anti-tail. That suggests a change in the particle size distribution being ejected. A narrow jet can be gas dominated with fine dust and trained. A broader, more sheet-like anti-tail implies larger grains and more dust mass. That would be consistent with a surface region that is shedding bigger particles, either because the gas flow is different or because the surface has been mechanically altered and is now releasing chunks and grains that were previously locked in. If true, that means the object is not just venting, it is physically changing. Now let's pause and ask the practical question, why should you care? Because interstellar objects are not just cool visitors. They are physical samples from other star systems. They are time capsules from regions we cannot reach. Every detail about how they behave near a star tells us something about their composition, their structure, and the conditions they formed under. If 3i Atlas is releasing unusually large grains, that implies something about its cohesion and internal makeup. If it has multiple active regions that turn on and off with changing geometry, that implies layering or heterogeneous composition. If it can sustain activity post-perihelion in a way that creates complex dust structures that suggest thermal inertia and volatile retention properties that might differ from many solar system comets we're used to studying. In plain language, this is one of the few times we get to watch alien geology respond to a star up close in real time. So what happens next? The next phase of the story is not more dramatic language. It's better measurements. Hubble gives structure in visible wavelengths. But what you want next is spectroscopy and infrared thermal characterization, the kind of data that can tell you what the jets are actually made of and how fast the material is moving. When you measure jet velocities, you can discriminate between different mechanisms. If the weaker opposite feature has a velocity signature consistent with direct nucleus outflow, that supports dual jets. If it looks like a dust component being pushed and shaped by radiation pressure, that supports particle sorting. If the spectra show certain volatiles strongly, that supports thermal lag and subsurface heat conduction. You also want more time series imaging. If the relative brightness of the two features varies periodically, that can reveal rotation. 
if the orientation shifts in a way consistent with a wobbling jet, that can constrain the rotation axis. If the features change rapidly, that can indicate new surface evolution, like vent opening or closure. And crucially, you want to compare the observed morphology to the orbital plane geometry at those dates. If the dominant feature aligns with the orbital plane, you lean anti-tail. If it aligns with solar direction in a stable way, you lean jet. If it behaves like both, you may be seeing a mixed system. Now, let's zoom out for a moment and talk about the larger scientific narrative. When the first interstellar object was detected, it caught everyone off guard because we simply weren't looking for them with the seriousness and sensitivity we have now. The second object looked more comet-like, but still raised questions. With each interstellar visitor, the lesson has been the same. Nature has more variety than our labels can handle. Comet and asteroid are not always clean categories. Many small bodies are mixtures. Many bodies have surface crusts that hide volatile interiors. Many bodies behave differently depending on their thermal history. And an interstellar object has a very different thermal history than something born and raised in the outer solar system. It may have spent millions of years in deep cold and then suddenly experienced a sharp heating event near a star. That can produce behavior we do not see often in the solar system because most objects here have already been through many perihelion passages and have had their surfaces processed over time. So, a sudden appearance of complex jets, anti-tails, and evolving dust features might not mean impossible. It might mean fresh, fresh material, fresh volatiles, fresh fractures, fresh response. That is a big deal. Now, I want to bring this back to what you can actually watch for as a viewer who wants to track the story. Here's the checklist. First, watch for whether the two-feature structure persists beyond December and whether it changes in orientation relative to the orbital plane. Persistent alignment with the orbital plane strengthens the dust sheet anti-tail interpretation. Second, watch for any reported estimates of particle sizes in the dust. If researchers start talking about larger grains, that supports the idea that the object is shedding heavier material. Third, watch for any updated rotation period estimates. If the light curve suggests the period changed significantly since July, that supports ongoing torque effects from outgassing and evolving vents. Fourth, watch for spectroscopic mentions of key volatiles like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and water. Different volatiles drive different activity regimes. Some can remain active farther out than you might expect. And finally, watch for whether the activity declines smoothly or in steps. Smooth decline suggests a stable sublimation process. Stepwise changes suggest vents opening, closing, or surface restructuring. What you should not do is treat one set of images as a final verdict. This is a moving target, literally, and the story is in the evolution. The December images are not the ending. They are a new chapter. So where does that leave us right now? It leaves us with a very clear, very exciting scientific position. Hubble observed 3i Atlas in December and saw a structure that differs substantially from July. The object shows a dominant sunward anti-tail-like feature and a secondary opposite feature that persists across multiple dates. That means something changed. Either the viewing geometry revealed new components, the surface activity shifted, or the dust environment evolved in a way that our simple models did not predict at first glance. None of that requires dramatic claims. It does require attention. And the reason the scientific community cares is simple. You do not get many chances to study interstellar material up close. Every anomaly is a clue, and every clue is a chance to learn something real about the diversity of small bodies in our galaxy. If you want to keep tracking this in a disciplined way, this is exactly the kind of moment where you subscribe and stay with the updates. Because the next data release, especially anything that adds spectra or time series evolution, will either simplify this puzzle or deepen it. Either way, it will be informative. Because the most honest summary of 3i Atlas so far is not mystery, and it's not answers, it's new constraints. And in science, constraints are progress. Thanks for watching. If you want, in the next video we can do something very specific. We can break down what an anti-tail is with simple diagrams, then overlay that logic onto the December observation dates to see which interpretation fits the geometry best. Until then, keep looking up and keep your curiosity sharper than your